It's true. Before this tournament, I thought Terunofuji would struggle to hold the rank of Komusubi. His need for a rest at the end of September, after this crushing defeat, was one reason. Mainly though, I expected his foes to keep doing this. Parry him forcefully from the side, and his failing knees make him look about 70. Yet, to my surprise, most of the men he fought were unable to do this. Were their tactics totally wrong? Or is he just sublime in stopping them? You can judge for yourselves from the video evidence I'm about to show, with the questions alone hinting at what a fascinating game of chess Sumo can actually be. On day one, Kagayaki went for a right throat hold, hoping to follow up with a left armpit press, believing he had the strength to knock Teru backwards. But the height of his right elbow was a gift to the Mongolian, who simply knocked it skywards, then hammered the exposed armpit. On day two, there was even less danger of a parry. Even a fit Asanoyama wouldn't countenance it, for he simply has to prove how muscular he is. We've already been over his failed tactics, rendered yet more useless by an injured right shoulder. The interesting one was day three, when Ornoshaw miserably failed to replicate his September success. As then, he tried to tip the right armpit. Like Kagayaki, he attempted the right throat hold. But Teru's counter was genius, hooking the right from underneath and clamping the left at the second attempt. Ornoshaw had to free that left arm to avoid a nasty break, and his frantic movement to do so not only left his armpit exposed, but his body in a spin. And once sideways on, his only concern was how well he would land on the floor cushions. There was no parry from Okinomi on day four. He feels his best chance always lies with an inside left. When that failed, he tried to throw Teru off balance with an outside right. An interesting theory, but one that only stands a chance of working when Teru hasn't locked in a grip of his own. Hokuto Fuji likes a left parry or two and really tried to execute one on day five, but Teru's firmly planted diagonal stance and firmness of elbow was not to give way. The left clamped movement on the right before finding its way to the belt and demonstrating awesome power. And on day six, we saw the same theme played out. Teru making himself big, making his gestures big, to hem his foe in from both sides. The men who best fathomed how to avoid this would see their chances of winning multiply. Surprisingly, it took one win, six loss Wakataka Kage to point the way to victory on day seven. Sliding sideways at the Tachiai, then tunneling in from a diagonal to back Teru against the ropes. But he too got clamped by the right and straightened up, then opened up for a left scoop throw. A little tweaking was needed. Thus, on day eight did Dai Eisho broadly copy that Tachiai, but once hitting the diagonal, focused all energy on staying outside Teru's feared left arm. Two parries to the left elbow later, and Dai Eisho had set himself up for a second charge. Now unable to clamp with the left, a flustered Teru resorted to shoving, and finally exposed his left armpit, fearing the threat to his backpedaling knees should he teeter any further. His first defeat duly ensued, and that's why we love great thrusting. It stops even insanely strong belt fighters from having everything their own way. But just when we thought we'd seen the perfect stop Teru game plan, Takayasu took things to a new level the following day.
That was just tactical brilliance in action. The fruitful attack from the right diagonal, combined with threats to the nape of the neck, causing Teru to stumble the full 360. And then, admittedly you need to be of a certain size to do this, but the use of the outside left grip to swing him into a right side attack on the pectoral. If not off the scale, that was at least Orzeki level. But it also speaks volumes for Teru's condition and ability that that was the level of tactical sophistication and fine execution needed to handle him in November. We thought the Mongolian's title chances to be gone and wondered if his confidence would slide, but not a bit. He was firstly aided by some inept sumo from Tobizaru on day 10. How on earth did the flying monkey think he could win from there? Then Myogiryu's penchant for a double inside attack left him destined to fall into the same trap on day 11. Clamped he duly was on both sides. Mitake Umi, nursing an injured right foot, was in no condition to emulate September, and allowed Teru's hands straight onto his belt. I think he tried a parry on the left, which is why Teru made triply sure to neutralize it. And on day 13, Ryuden sought to impose his style rather than tailor a plan, and found his confidence in an inside grip sorely misplaced. Teru's thewy right arm was so possessed, it could have wrestled a bear away that day. Shimanoumi likes to pound armpits with his left, but on day 14, Teru sliced the right deep inside to cut off the parrying angle, then set to work on Shima's right, pinning the elbow doggedly before landing the outside left grip. The tournament's biggest surprise package pushed him hard, but tactically, Teru was just too astute. And then came the finale. Against Takakesho's booming and perfectly angled thrusts, Teru was basically helpless, until a mistake from the Ozeki allowed him to use height advantage to clutch the belt. But without the mistake second time round, Teru had nothing off which to feed and must now find his own specific way of dealing with this wrecking ball on legs in January. Will Teru shoot for the title again next time? Or will he settle for the 10 wins he needs to keep his Ozeki challenge ticking along? They say title charges take an extra week to get over. A big ask for a man with crippled knees. Make that two big asks if you add in July. His superhuman strength must therefore be managed within very human limitations.